be talking about uh, automation, particularly security automation. One of the, although DevOps is primarily, a little, a little lower would be okay, I think I hear a little feedback. Although DevOps is primarily about culture, it's one of the hallmarks of DevOps is the pro changing your processes so you have more automation. Um, and so we'll be talking about security automation in that re respect as well. So let's little talk about who I am. Uh, I've been in IT, well, a long time. Longer than some of you have been alive, I suspect. Um, I uh, spent about 10 years doing system administration, although the t title I had in those days was a system programmer, which is probably closer to a, you know, uh, the engineering positions today. Um, the, uh, I founded the Linux HA project, it's also called Heartbeat or Pacemaker. How many people in the audience have used Pacemaker or heard of it before? So I founded that project, led it for about nine, 10 years, something like that, and then started this project, this open source project, the Assimilation Project, in 2010. And I founded a company around it in 2013, and I worked in um, Bell Labs and SUSE and IBM for all, all those years, right? Except for the last three, when I've been in this other company of my own. So um, sometimes I say outrageous things, and um, you know, I'm told that they wouldn't let you bring rotten tomatoes and eggs in here. So maybe, you know, if the time comes, you can use these. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> really, I meant for that to go higher. I meant to go more like that. <laughs> My apologies. So anyway, if, if, uh, if it comes to the right spot where you think I'm saying something, you know, sometimes you had a speaker, maybe you thought they were kind of full of something. Well, my eyes are brown, and sometimes I've had people think that that meant it was full up to here. But, um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's your judgment call, not mine. Uh, but, um, so, this, this is kind of my background, and this is, this is uh, I'll t be talking about and demonstrating an open source project which helps you stay as secure and a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, so, from a security perspective here, uh, how many people think that, that you have plenty of good security staff, you have no trouble getting good security staff today? No? How about, do you think security is going to get better anytime soon? No? Do you think they have enough, now, the, so as you, as you go to DevOps and agile kinds of practices in your environment, how many of you think that, that you're going to be able to keep up with that increased speed of things happening? If your security ke team can't keep up with you have now, if you speed it up, is that going to make it easier for them? No, huh. So let's talk about a few trends that aren't so good. 30% uh, of all break-ins come through systems people didn't know existed. They're not on the books. Maybe, they're, maybe they're, they were taken off the books, maybe they're never put on the books. But you know what, the, the same thing that you're trying not to think about, the bad guys are looking for, and when they find it, they'll get in. 90% of everybody, part of security as well, if you don't know there are three pillars of security and one of them is availability. So from an availability perspective, 90% of everybody, and these are people running Chef and Puppet and the best uh, DevOpsy kind of tools, 90% of those people have had failures of services they were not monitoring. How many people think they could answer the question, um, how many services am I not monitoring in, in like a, uh, an hour? No? A week? Yeah, maybe a few for a week, a month? Anyway, most people don't really know what they're not monitoring. They have no way of knowing. They have one system for monitoring and another system uh, that knows what all services you have, but it's hard to compare them together. 70% uh, of people who get in compliance with things like PCI compliance or, or other kinds of compliance, this, they get in compliance, they go to all this trouble, they get all this stuff going, and then at the end of that time, a year later, they're not in compliance and they didn't know it. It's hard to stay in compliance. 30% of the people actually allow, well, you know, we don't really start monitoring stuff until it breaks. Anybody do that? Yeah, you know I wouldn't admit it either. Um, and 30% of all systems in the average data center are actually doing nothing useful. The only thing they're doing is, is at making a good contribution to global warming. They are space eaters. These are real statistics. I didn't make them up. Uh, and the... the when I talk to people who do this kind of thing, mostly they say, yeah, except I think it's worse than that. Um, so a little about this project and what it does. Really, we, we have discovery-driven automation, the kinds of stuff we do in security. The talk will be primarily about security, but it does a bunch of other things as well. Basically, we, discovery drives everything, because if, if it's manually configured, 
it's probably manually configured incorrectly. Because if you have to do these things manually, the work to keep them up often gets dropped on the floor. And the basis of, of trying to put new features in your products, trying to keep up with the, you know, the stream of security problems you have, and trying to keep up with um, just the day-to-day the, the -day things of, oh, I had a system crash. Well, let's figure out what the root cause of that is and make it not happen again. Um, and the key thing I'll be talking about here primarily, uh, it, it's very, very ex extensible. Uh, you know, I'm talking about monitoring 100,000 servers off of just one. Yeah, really. I mean, so that's one of the places where it doesn't necessarily sound reasonable. And everything here drives the, we'll be talking primarily about best practice analysis. But I have a little ch chance, a little more time here, so I'm going to put a little bit of technical detail into this, which I love to put in. But with a short talk, it's hard to do that. And everything goes into a graph database. So we monitor, model your entire environment as a graph. But that's because when you go to the board to draw it, you draw a graph. You know, circles and arrows. That's a graph. I don't mean a chart like an Excel chart. I mean a graph like a graph theoretic kind of thing, where you have you know circles and arrows and so on. That's how we actually model it in the database. So. Sometimes people think this is unreasonable, and it's usually when I start making claims like this, especially if I'd gotten into a little more detail, it sounds unreasonable. Scalability without complexity, really, this is very simple. And discovery without pings or port scans, you know, because you, what's the point of a security tool if it sets off your security alarms? Anybody think that's a good idea? No, I don't either. So this is a, it's kind of perhaps a little unreasonable. So I think the thing to do is I can explain how we scale, which is probably the most outrageous claim. Uh, so that your grandmother would understand, really, truly. So, so at my church on Wednesday nights, we get together. It's nice to be at a church for something like this, you know. We get together for a meal, and we stand around kind of holding hands like this in a circle. And the pastor's praying over the food, and we're standing there doing this. And w while we're praying there, if Aunt Sally passes out, who notices first? Are you guys awake? The, the, the two people holding her hands, that's correct. So... For you to participate in this human monitoring arrangement, how many hands do you have to have? Two. Right. And if I added 1,000 people to this arrangement, how many hands would you have to have? Two. Did your work go up because I added 1,000 people? No. And that's how we do it. That's why it scales the way it does. We use this full distribution of all the work to the different servers. So the central server mostly tries to do nothing. And doing nothing is scales really well. Doing nothing scales really well. And I, I like to claim we do nothing better than anybody. <laughs> so, uh, and if you want to look at what that, you know, if you prefer the computer science diagram, it looks more like this. You know, this machine is heart beating F and B, and B is heart beating A and, a and C, and so on. You get the idea. And uh, this is the current implementation. Basically, this is how we know what's going on in your environment all the time. We know that we're not missing something. Because if one of our machines goes away or one of our agents stops running, we know because of the, the heartbeat arrangement here. So to look at this in a, a little more cool way, uh, uh, this is something we haven't yet done. But uh, I'll, I'll, you'll see why ex I'll explain it a little bit here. This is, this is one of my favorite charts that, I, know, that I've have to, I have to leave out of a shorter talk. So imagine instead of having one ring, like we currently do, that we had multiple rings. And let's say that this, these, are, these machines are all on a switch. And, and so now the cool thing is all these heartbeats are on, all go within, just within a switch. So that the traffic doesn't go anywhere else. Of course, the problem is if you lose the switch, well, you wouldn't know, would you? Because there's an old Harlan Ellison science fiction story called, I have no mouth and I must scream. There are all the machines that are there going, mm, mm, mm. no one can hear them. So instead, so you nominate one machine on each switch and a subnet to create a second ring, and one machine on each subnet to create a top-level ring. And if you have multiple sites, you can do the same thing for one level at the top across each site. Now, 95% of your traffic stays within the switch, and something really cool happens here, too, that I'll get to. So, so, so you, now you can monitor many, many, many sites with practically no traffic at all. I mean, just really traffic, the only traffic that goes across sites is, is the heartbeats between the machines that are one machine on each side. So if this machine dies, it, you get the report from this guy and this guy. But if this machine dies, you normally get four reports from this machine, this machine, this machine, and this machine. It's four neighbors because it's on two rings. Make sense? So what happens? How many reports do I get of its death if its switch dies? Two. Oh, 
Isn't that cool? You can look at the number of machines that reported it dead and tell whether it was a switch failure or a server failure. How many people think that's kind of cool? Yeah, isn't that cool? Um, but the, it's, it's the same technology and the same techniques just applied into, in a way that's topology aware. And yeah, we know enough information to set this up, again, without manual configuration. Uh, we haven't yet done it, but uh, there are reasons why you need to do this anyway when you look at things like um, DMZs and, and uh, firewall zoning and stuff like that. Um, but, so we have an architecture then which has a central server where everything is, is, is brought in together and then we have what we call, this is the assimilation project, so our agents are called nanoprobes. The idea is we inject your machines with nanoprobes and assimilate them and have them join the collective. So if you don't like bad Star Trek jokes, you're in the wrong place. Um, and we put all the results in a graph database because graph databases also can answer questions easily like what all depends upon the server directly or indirectly? What all systems are part of this process really? I have a business process here and I know this web server is part of it. What else does it depend upon? How many people really think they could answer that question for everything in their environment right now? No, me neither. Um, but this is the kind of stuff we put in here that, to discover. And we use that, I'm going on to the security stuff. Um, we, security is one of the things we do, but you can see how when you know stuff, you can do stuff, right? Um, so we discover all kinds of things, like all the IP and MAC addresses on, on every subnet uh, that we're on, er, uh, network connectivity through CDP or LLDP packets, packages and versions installed. Wouldn't it be nice to know exactly which machines have a certain vulnerable package on it? Uh, and that now includes Docker packages, uh, Docker instances as well. Uh, I added that for this uh, conference. I mean, it was, I was going to add it anyway, but I put the release out just a couple days before the conference. Uh, we t because we know what all is talking on the network, we know what to check some in terms of making sure that everything that's talking on the network isn't, uh, hasn't, has the integrity it's supposed to have. A lot of other security settings and permissions, SSD configurations, PAM, Proxys, AuditD, blah, 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 lots of stuff. I'll just go on. Um, so we then t try and compare things to best practices, and we give you a risk scoring for a machine, for an area, for, the, for your overall environment that helps you track. Anybody here ever, at your boss, you're trying to catch up and keep things going, and you're really working hard to make things right, and your boss comes and says, what have you been doing anyway, right? And you'd like to be able to show that you're actually making progress, right? So one of the things we can do here is you can have an aggregate risk score across your environment, and you can see how it gets better and better as you fix these holes, and then gets worse again as you get new vulnerabilities in. And you can use that for a couple different things. First of, all, first of all, prove what you're actually doing, and second of all, demonstrate that maybe you don't have enough staff to do the job, because you can see this, the curve we're on, and you can see that what, you know I'm not going to get there for 17 more years. Um, that's not a problem to me, because in 17 years, I'll be retired. Um, so we do all these, this stuff here as well. You've read all this by now. Um, so our best practice analysis, everything we do, remember, we try and do nothing as much as possible. So when something changes, that information comes back to the central server. And if there are security rules on that, then at that moment, we evaluate the security rules. So we don't check them quarterly, annually, weekly, monthly, or daily. We check them at the right time. That is to say, we only check them when they change. I know that's a radical idea of not like doing a quarterly audit or something, but wouldn't it be better to have an audit that says that 15 minutes ago, somebody made a change that brought us out of compliance? And the interesting thing about that is it changes the dynamic of the conversations. Instead of having, there are, two, there are normal, normally two ways in which you find out you're out of compliance. There's the bad way and the worst way. The bad way is that your auditor comes around and says, okay, you're actually out of compliance here, and then there's all this uh, yelling and screaming and, and all different things are going on uh, in that, and, and people, you know, things, bad check marks, bad check marks getting on your review, stuff like that, C career limiting events. And then there's the worst way, which is your security team comes in and says, what were you thinking? And the reason why they would tell you that is because they, they're tra tracking down a bad guy and discovered that what you did let him in. So there's the bad way and the worst way. Wouldn't it be better instead to say, oh, we just had a change, no auditor knows, no bad guy knows, and now we can have an adult conversation. Um, you know, as a parent, you, uh, we, call, we used to call those, uh, still do call them, teachable moments. Oh, you mean that was a bad thing? I shouldn't have done that? No, you shouldn't have done that. 
Or maybe the security guy says, this is a bad thing, and you explain, well, the application doesn't work if I don't. And then they say, oh, okay, we'll make an exception for it. And then you get that taken care of so that when the audit comes around, it's all done. And you do that incrementally across, continually as things change. Anybody think that would be a better way of handling security incidents? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I'm going to do a demo now. And this is key things about the demo. Somewhere here, alt tab. Alt tab should show me something, right? Um, there we go. Um, that's the one I want. So this is, um, so I'm going to, Just to make sure I don't have a demo still running from last night. Apparently, I can't. No, I did, actually. Yeah, I did have a demo running, or there had been a message that didn't come out. So this is slightly in the way. This, something's in the way. Oh, the microphone. I'll see. Thanks. Just, yeah, said it somewhere harmless. Not in front of the speaker. Um, so this is. Um, so what the demo is going to be is showing you the software starting up and then going th this, by the way, this is an open source project, although I have a company found around, it is really an open source project. At this point in time, there is zero proprietary software in it. It is 100% open source. And as I go forward in this, um, the demo itself will, I, I'll, I completely wipe out the database and start over. So e nothing here was configured by, in, in advance, and nothing here was configured by hand. Everything was done through discovery. So that means that it's right, and it's up to date. Anybody ever seen, I know this never happens to you, but sometimes I've worked places where configurations didn't match what they should have. Well, the nice thing, if you're discovering it, well, it, and if you're continually updating it, well, it's going to be right. There, by the way, this also helps eliminate documentation problems of certain kinds. You know that there are three kinds of documentation. The first kind of documentation, the most common kind, is the documentation you do not have. The second most common kind is documentation which is incorrect today. And the last and final kind is documentation which will be incorrect tomorrow. There is no fourth kind. So instead, imagine that you could actually query a database to replace some of your documentation, and that the software was keeping it up to date within minutes of changes. That's compared to the speed that human beings operate at, that's real time, right? It's not compared to you know, telephony real time, but it's real time, or device driver real time. But compared to de uh, you know, the, the, the speed at which human beings operate, that's real time. So let's do the demo. So this is going to start. Uh, pe can people see that in the back? I'm sorry, it's, I made it big. Yeah, you can. That's really good. So what we've done here is I started the demo. Can I join a V4 multicast? Oh, shit, I have to have an IP address. Damn it. Oh, my apologies. I, I forgot I had to configure. So I actually have to come on the wireless here. I forgot. Uh, so what's, which one am I supposed to join here? I don't see church and state. I see Ch Jason's iPhone. Um, <laughs> so what one am I supposed to join here? Sorry. Scroll down. D does anybody see it here? I don't see one that says church. I see some over here that say church and state, but th this is members. Uh, what am I supposed to be joining here? Sorry, guys. What's the name, please? Someone? Wi-Fi. What? Church and state members? CNS. The, the CNS or just church and state? Hello? Is anybody here on the Wi-Fi? There's no one here on the Wi-Fi. Members, there's members fast, but there's no just members. Okay, now what's the, what's the password? All right, all in caps. Thank you. Sorry, I should have done this beforehand. I'm about out of battery, too, apparently. Um, am I, so let's see what we can do here before I run out of battery. It says I have 22 minutes or 22 seconds. I don't know which. I um, hope it's 22 minutes. Um, so let's go, let's go back to the demo here. I'll start the demo again, or try it. No, that's not it. Right, it's over here. 
There we go. Just in case it got started anyway. Yeah, it did. Some, some of it did. Okay, this is better. Sorry. Um, I don't actually have, use the internet for anything, but you know, if it tries to discover stuff and there's no IP address, it gets, it, it wants, for some reason it wants actually to be connected to the network. So we started it up and there's an option that I gave it that's probably scroll, it's scrolled off the screen by now, but it basically said erase the database. Uh, and oh, we're now doing discovery of various things here. This is stuff from Etsy audit D, audit D .conf. Oh, we're failing some rules. Oh, we're succeeding, passing some rules. And it tell, these, these identifiers, these are, happens to be the, it's, although it says NIST, it's really the DISA. I don't know why I put NIST when I should have put DISA. The, the DISA security rules for, for Linux. Um, and so we're now we're coming down here, uh, and for example, we're failing this one. Uh, permit root login is supposed to be false, but it's not set to false. Um, oops, uh, that's an example of one. And now we're coming down here, and, it, and we're, we've discovered some services we're offering. Uh, it's scrolled off. Anyway, I'll talk about, so what, part of what went by, um, part of what went by, it said, I discovered this service, and I know how to monitor it. So I just monitor it. I discovered this service, I don't know how to monitor it. All those things happen. And now we've come down here, and we're setting our security score to 41. That means that we failed a bunch of rules. Um, the, the scoring goes by, by way of, um, well, I'll continue on, just as though it were there. Um, so it goes through a number of different, I really apologize. I should have plugged in a long time ago. Um, but so, yeah, I've had it on since I got here early this morning. Uh, in any case, the, uh, what it's gone through, it, 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 how many people here saw that it violated rules, right? Yeah, so it violated a number of rules, and there were some identifiers on those rules, right? So those, if you, if you look in syslog, there were long URLs in syslog. That's part of what would show here if, if we were on. That if you click on those URLs, it will take you to a site that gives you a detailed explanation of, of each of those rules and what the rule is, how to check for whether it, um, how to check for whether it, um, whether you're passing or failing that rule, what the meaning of the rule is, how, like I said, how to tell whether it's, um, whether you pass, how to determine manually if you pass this rule, and then how to, how to repair, repair, the, repair the damage. And this is all out of a project called the IT Best Practices Project. That's another project that I started separately from this for the sole purpose of collecting best practices. Now, most of the best practices there, like all but one or two, are security best practices. But um, just because that's, I could, I could get all those from the government and put them in there automatically. And so that was a lot less work than creating them all by yourself. But the idea is that this is a place you can go to, to store best practices, and then we've gone in our software and use those same identifiers and put the URLs in that will point you at that site so that you can go figure out how to solve these problems yourself. Um, there are several different things that I'll just have to describe to you because, uh, I mean, I could spend time looking for my power supply, which I know is here. It's just, if I do, I won't, you know, I won't be talking. So let's talk instead. Um, so the, uh, so the, we'll find those best practice rules. Some of the stuff that went on there is, for example, there's a, there's a message that says, uh, going off and discovering the checksums of 33 binaries, right? It turns out that everything that's talking on the network, client or server, it, part of what it discovers is the full path name of the binary. So it goes off and does, goes and gets that uh, information. Ah, excellent, thank you. Um, goes off and gets that information uh, from the, uh, from the um, distraction. Goes off and gets the information uh, for the, those full path names. And after doing that, it then goes off and does, says, go out there and collect checksums on them. And actually, when it comes back, it said, I w went out looking for 33 best uh, 33 uh, binaries, but it came back with checksums on like 287. And the reason why, excellent, thank you. Uh, well, let's see if it will power back on. Um, and I'll, we'll do with this or, or not. Uh, we'll see if we can get it going again. But, so it, it'll do the, ch the reason why it comes back with more than it went out for, for is because it then does an LDD. People know what LDD is? 
that's to look for the libraries that are, that are, that are used by it. And it also picks up the, the checksums of all the libraries as well. And part of what it does, it gets the binaries on there. And if, it's, if they're Java applications, it also gets the, 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 the binaries from the class path, I mean, the, 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 the jars from the class path, and also checksums them as well. And so all of that stuff comes back. And oh, by the way, that means automatically, we're, no matter what applications you have running on that machine, we don't necessarily check some everything on the machine, but everything that's talking on the network. And if you have an attacker who hasn't modified or put anything on to talk on the network, I don't know how they got on or how they're going to get back on again. Right? So for the most part, this will tend to catch the things that your attackers are likely to do to you. And by the way, do you have to configure anything? No, you didn't have to configure anything. Add a new application, start a new service. Oh, it starts monitoring that in the same way. So all of these things come back in an event API. Gosh, look at that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> look at that. Wow. I'm impressed. <laughs> you know, this never works like this. This is not how life works, guys. <laughs> so. Now, you, almost all the stuff I said, I would have said anyway. It's just I would have pointed at things on the screen. So because the, because the Wi-Fi wi access is so lousy here, I'm actually going to bring up this. Here's an example of what the best practices rules for something look like. In the back, can you read that at all, or does it need to be a little bigger? A little bigger? OK, Control plus, right? That's it. Control shift plus. Like that, right? So. Um, so the, uh, I had a mouse here somewhere. Anyway, the, I guess I have to move my mouse over here. There it is. And try and scroll this where I can't really see what I'm doing. Right? That's how that works, too. So anyway, severity is medium. What, what the, uh, uh, basically, our scoring method is if it's low priority, we give it one point. If it's medium, we give it two. And, and what do you think we give it if it's high? Hello? Are you guys, like, dead? What's up with this? Three. There we go. Three. Somebody can add. This is good. So, um, so the system must not send ICMP v4 redirects by default. The IC, and then it goes on to explain the long description, how to check the correct configuration, and how to fix it. Right. So those URLs are pointed to and go into your syslogs. And you can actually just look up the, the ID as well. Um, there's another site. There's another, uh, basically, a, a, a query site on this same place. So this is the kind of way we help you do that. Now, I have, for the demo, I have some more cool stuff to do in the demo. Oh, but I have to, like, find, I have to get my mouse cursor back. Can anybody see my cursor there? There it is. OK, I need to go to the left, farther to the left. OK, here, and I need to bring this guy up. Um, so let's start with a. Because this is a graph database, there are things you can do um, to visualize it, to draw on the screen the same kind of thing you would draw on the board. The system models, the, we model your infrastructure the same way you do. You go to the board and you draw circles and arrows. That's what we do. The circles are called nodes, and the, re and the arrows are called relationships. Let's see if I can make this work. If I can go over here. Yeah, that, that one, that, that's the one I want. No. I have to go over here and click on this, I guess. Yeah, OK. So let's try this. OK. Now, that's not very big, is it? Um, and let's try something a little bit bigger. Let's try the same thing. Oh, yeah, I have to be on the right screen. OK, I've got to move this. I can't see. Hmm. OK. Oh, image magic. I've apparently tried to, the image magic thing has come up on this screen. Lovely. Um, oh, here it is. Um, this mess. Go over here again. Oh, yeah, right. I, I hate it when things come up on the wrong screen and the mouse is on the wrong screen. It's just really crappy. OK. Now, now let's see if we can repeat that command. But let's change the DPI to something more 
dollar sign. What do you suppose, 150? 125. That's just a wild guess. See, the thing is, having this, well, okay, that wasn't what I had in mind. Oh, it's on the wrong screen. So that's the scrolling piece from, okay. Now let's see if we can make this bigger. Okay, now the, the aspect ratio is really horrible, but um, you get the idea. So what, this, what we have here, this is, this, is a, this is a picture of, anybody, how many people here know what an attack surface is? This is a visualization of the attack surface of my laptop. So this is the laptop, and what you can't see here and you can't read in the back is the security risk is 41. I think it should be higher than that, but it's 41 at the moment. The status is up and, and various other aspects. And these are the services that we're offering on this machine. Um, this is Dropbox uh, running on the machine, SSHD, Java, other things here. Uh, and then here are the, and you can't read this at all. Um, IP port combinations. Yeah, I think the native resolution of this projector is lower than I currently have ever, my machine set to. Anyway, uh, these are the IP port combinations. And um, all these that are dashed around them, those are not being monitored. So that you can tell, just from looking at this, uh, just sort of threw it in for free that those are services which are offered on this machine but not monitored. And these up here, where they come out of here, the arrow goes in this direction, these are IP port combinations that they're calling out on. So, people, so an attacker could come in through any of these IP port combinations in this direction, or they could, as you connect out this direction, they could uh, do man-in-the-middle attacks between here and the, and for example, between here and Dropbox. And there's something similar here for, what is, I don't even know what this is. I don't know what that is, whatever it is. This, this, notice it doesn't, these are kind of shaped like file folders and this is just a box. This is a client only outbound connection. Uh, something for a virtual file system daemon. Um, and it's connecting out. Uh, so those are the places that, this is a visualization from discovery. If you change your system, add new things and run this again, you get a different answer. We have visualizations for this, visualizations specifically for monitoring and other kinds of things as well. Um, so the visualization, this is kind of cool, the visualization stuff is kind of cool. So, three minutes. So I have a bunch of others too. And there are a bunch of queries you can do. Um, yeah, um, so there are a bunch of queries you can do as well that tell you things like what services are running on this machine and I actually am running Dropbox, I mean, no, sorry, uh, uh, a Docker instance as well. So for example, you can say, tell me what all packages are installed. And it will tell you all of them, including those installed in Docker. Docker made a big announcement about this security thing they offer. Anybody notice the Docker announcement about their security stuff? This is the same thing. Um, it took me a lot less time, I think, to do. But we already had the infrastructure to do all this in, right? So this is the kind of stuff we do. There are a bunch of other things as well. I'll just don't tell you the, what I'm not going to get to in the demo. and. Uh, uh, let's see, I could talk, so there's a, there's a way to do triage here so, that, so it can help you do efficiently know what way to attack the problem. If your machine, the average machine will fail about a hundred of these instances out of the box, a hundred of these rules out of the box. You have a thousand machines, you have a hundred thousand problems. Anybody think, feel, does, can you spell overwhelmed, right, overwhelmed? But this will help you triage it and figure out the best approach, where to start working to solve that problem to make it go away. The package, as I mentioned, there's also, it collects all the IP addresses as well. Um, all the things that are, there's a query that just does, tell me everything I'm not monitoring. And as I said, uh, the Docker stuff as well, but I'm not, I'm, I'm almost done. So anyway, the, um, what I will say though is go back here to this, if I can. I don't know if I can or not. One more. All right, so done, done. Okay, anyway, that's it. Uh, so the thing is, it's an open source project. It's called the Assimilation Project. The, if you go to assimilationsystems.com or smproj.org, it'll get you started on this. And the, the thing is, what I think you should do is look into this and actually give it a try. 
Okay, and it, as an open source project, you have the opportunity to contribute to it as well. It can discover anything. Is there something you want it to discover? Write a script for it. It's actually very straightforward. Uh, basically, you, you, trans you write a script to spit it out in JSON. Thanks for your time, and I'm out of time. <laughs>